How's everybody doing? Doing good? Praise God. Praise God. Today we're going to be talking about rebuilding life. Turn to the book of Nehemiah. We're going to basically be doing a summary of the book of Nehemiah. But, you know, now that, you know, all these restrictions are lifted and things are opening up and, you know, people are still living in uncertain times. You know, they're like, well, what if there's a, what if it comes back or what if the economy doesn't recover or whatever happens to our country? And, you know, you can get caught up in all the what ifs. But all throughout time, when God has ministered to his people during hard times, it always started in our own heart and how God is dealing with us and what he wants to speak to us. And Nehemiah is about rebuilding. And and, and it's about rebuilding life because the walls of Jerusalem are a typology of the life of the believer. And so we're going to look at it in the light of what Scripture says. And we're going to summarize through the book of Nehemiah and, and, and really see what rebuilding is all about. Because right now, that's where we're at. You know, some people lost their jobs. Some people lost, you know, their homes. Some people lost different things in their life. Some people even lost their identity. And why am I here? And what is my purpose? And God is looking down on a needful people. In a time where, you know, most kids don't even believe in God anymore. This country is going downhill so fast. If there was ever a time to to shine as a light to the world, for the church to just beam God's love, it's this time. But in our hearts, in our minds, are we ready for that? Are we right with God in that? Because you want to know something? We all desire to be there. Our heart yearns to be there. We hunger and thirst for a deeper relationship with the Lord. And that's what he's calling us all to. And just as a little introduction to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and we're going to jump from chapter to chapter a couple, certain, cover certain points. But what's going on is God has brought judgment upon Jerusalem. It's been completely wiped out by the Babylonians. And now it's been several years later, uh, uh, like 70 years later, and and the people have already gone back, but the one they've gone back, it's in shambles. You know, this big, once beautiful wall that was surrounding and protecting the city is broken down, and it's a bunch of garbage, and the stones are burned. You know, so you can't build on them again. And, and so there's no real protection. And the neighbors, the, the, the different uh, peoples in the area, the, the, they're coming in. And what they're doing is they're, they're just going in and they're just having their way. You know, because this is no real people. We're running this town. This is the way we're doing things. And they're, and they're uh, having their hold on the people. And they're being oppressed. And and Nehemiah is thinking about hometown. He's like, man, Jerusalem. You know, all the people went back with, you know, Ezra. And, you know, I wonder how things are going. If they're picking up things, things are really turning out good. You know, he's getting all excited, you know. And his job is cupbearer to the king, which is basically like, uh, almost like a king's bodyguard. You have to be so trusted because you have to be able to identify if somebody's trying to poison the king. Okay? Even to the point where you love him so much that you'll taste it yourself and risk your own life. But you learn to identify different things and, you know, to understand, okay, this one, this bread is poisoned or different things so that you can protect him. He's very trusted by the king, you know? But sometimes what would happen is guys would get, you know... Uh, um, get to the cupbearer and they grab his family and they say, if you don't slip this poison in, you know, we're going to kill your family. And so he'd, you know, do what they said and he'd be all bummed out and the king would see that as a sign that he was bummed out that something's happening 
and what's going on and his life may be in danger at that point you know and, and so his, his brother comes back from Jerusalem he says tell me all about it what's going on over there man is it getting revival or are you getting excited and he said man it is so bad over there it is nothing like what you think the walls are completely broken down. The people are disheartened. You know, they're being oppressed by the other peoples around them. It, it, it's a mess, you know. And then all of a sudden, Nehemiah, his heart breaks. And, and he's like, man, God, there's got to be something we can do. Because here's like 50,000 people that are just totally lost. Although they went back, there's no rebuilding happening. There's so many obstacles in the way. There's so many things that are uh, not allowing them to go forward. So many, not only oppressions, but distractions. You know? And so he breaks down and he says this prayer before the Lord in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. He says... And the scripture says, And so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and I mourned for many days. I was, fast, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant of mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. I have acted, we have acted very corruptly against you, and, you have not, and, not, and we have not kept your commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses, Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying that if you, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, some of you who were cast out from the farthest of heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen for my people, to dwell, for my name to dwell now these are your servants, your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire and fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day. For I pray that you, that, and you grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For he, I was the king's cupbearer. This is expression of a heart that wants to start over God. You know, he's just saying, you know what? We've blown it. You know what? I, I haven't been what I'm supposed to be. But now things are so bad, we're just calling on you. You say, if we turn and we call on you, you're going to be faithful and you're going to bless us and you're going to help us and you're going to be there for me. That's the heart that starts the rebuilding process. Humbling yourself before a sovereign and holy God. You got to remember that God is sovereign. He's not a genie the way you rub the lamp gets your wish. He's sovereign creator of the universe, king of kings and lord of lords, majestic on high, who is able to deliver. The scripture says, my thoughts of you are thoughts of good and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And he was saying this during the time that judgment was coming on his people. I'm not thinking bad things about you. I'm thinking good things about you. And he says, and if you seek me, you'll find me if you seek me with all your heart. And that's what Nehemiah was doing here. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17 says, For you do not desire sacrifice, or I would give it, and you don't delight in burnt offerings. 
The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. This is coming before God and say, I, I don't have all the answers, man. You know, my life has been like a dam where it's hole left to hole and I'm like this, you know, putting my foot in it, putting my fingers in it, putting my nose in it, trying to keep it from falling apart. And it's not working, God. I need you. Let's start over. Wash me and cleanse me of all my sin. I give you my heart all over again. You keep me. You help me. You direct me. This is where Nehemiah is. And, and it's a spirit to where we go before the Lord, not in fear. Like, please don't judge me, God. Please don't judge me, God. Don't let bad things happen to me, God. That's not the heart of God towards you. Romans chapter 8, verses 13 through 15 says, If you will live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live according to the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption in whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, is, is, is the way they would say at that time, the way we say daddy, except it's easier to say Abba. And a baby or a child will say Abba. You know, firstborn slave or the top steward of the house was not allowed to use this word. Only the intimacy of the child was allowed to use this word. And that's the intimacy that me and you have when we come before the throne of grace. He wants to bless you. He says, come and drink from the wells of salvation with joy. You want a fresh start? He's offering it to you. You, You're tired of trying to fix things yourself? He's ready to take over and put all the pieces together. Because only he can. So many, so, so many times we have to hit rock bottom before we finally figure out that, you know, God really knows what he's doing. He's the one that we really need to listen to, you know. But now the, the, what's going on is, you know, the king goes before the king and he's sad and the king notices. He says, why are you bummed out? What's going on? And, you know, Nehemiah's... You know, he gets that shot of fear in him because he knows, you know, this is a bad thing. He says, Lord, help me. Give me the right words. He says, hey, my hometown's left in shambles, man. I'm bummed out about my people. And the king goes, what do you need? Man, that's a big open door. But this guy had been praying, you know, if I go, I'm going to need this. And so when that time came, he says, what do you need? He says, I need wood, I need lumber, I need bricks, I need this, I need a, an army to go with me. And he knew exactly what he needed because he'd been praying about it for, for like three months, you know. And he says, you got it, whatever you want, go. And he goes, and he goes to the town, and, you know, he doesn't announce who he is or whatever, and he comes, and at night he gets on his horse, and he goes to go survey the walls to see how bad the damage is. And it's so bad that he has to get off his animal. And he has to start walking because there's no room. It's so messed up. And the next day, he, he decides, you know, I, I, I'm going to you know, go before the people. And I'm going to see them. And I'm, I'm going to tell them, you know, this is what's going on. And I'm going to lead them. Because they needed to be led. They needed someone to stand for them. They needed someone to protect them. They needed someone to lead them and guide them and show them the way. You see, Nehemiah, it, it, it has a Greek, it's a Hebrew word, but it has a Greek equivalent because the Old Testament's Hebrew, New Testament's Greek. And in the, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, in the New Testament, the word Nehemiah is called parakletos, which we call in the New Testament, Holy Spirit. That's one of his names, the comforter. Okay? And Nehemiah is now a type of the Holy Spirit coming to help the people rebuild their life rebuild the walls you know and he comes in and now that now that he's they're in a position to where they're willing to listen they've 
said, Lord, have your way. Now God brings Nehemiah, and he's about to speak to them, tell them how to go and how to be. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, it says, Then I said to them, You see the distress we are in, how Jerusalem lies in waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the walls of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them that the, how the hand of God was with me, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he spoke to me. And then they said, let us rise up and build. And they set their hands to do a good work. You see, now they get in the mindset, okay, God, you set it up. Do you want us to build? Let's go do it. We're willing to do it. You see, God wants to build those walls around your life. You know, life was not to be aimless. Life was not to be without purpose. Life was not to be without identity. And that's what this COVID-19 pandemic shutdown did for a lot of people. They lost all that. Now it's time to rebuild. God, you made me for a reason. What do you have me here for? What do you want out of my life? What are we going to do? I'm getting excited, Lord, because I know I'm right with you now. Because the only way anybody is right with God is if they go to the cross. They repent of their sins. You can't come and say, look how good I've been, God. No, none of us have. You humble yourself, you say, you're good. And he gives you his righteousness. He starts you over. And you say, Lord, let's see what you want to do. Let's rebuild. Just like the children of Israel said. We come to God. Let's rebuild. Let's start over. Lord, what do you want to do? Let's fix this. And God begins to move from there. But every time that God doesn't move, Satan does a counter move. Isn't that right? You know, ever feel like, man, I just had the most awesome day at church today. And then all of a sudden you go home and, and you know, somebody's come in and pulled all your plants out of your front yard. And you're like, ah, and you totally get in the flesh. And it's like, oh, man, I was just, it's cloud nine, just five minutes ago, man. Now, now the whole spirit's quenched. Because, you know what, the devil is trying to bring you down. Okay, he is very real. He interferes with your life. It's like you don't hear from him until you decide to commit. Until you decide, Lord, here I go. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do it. Let's go, Lord. And it's not like I'm going to try to be holy. No, I'm going to stop believing lies and I'm going to hold to the truth. You see? I'm going to stop believing, you know, all these things that are keeping me down. I'm going to start believing what you said, that you killed the flesh, that you gave me power over the flesh, that you're going to fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you're going to lead me, that you're going to guide me, that you're going to sustain me, and that I'm going to be able to do this in you. Because what you said in your word, I believe it. You said it. I'm going to hold on to it. That's the key to Christian living. Not, I'm going to be so good. No, you can't do anything. You've had to learn that by now. There is no good in me. But I believe he's good. And I believe he's empowered me. And I believe he's leading me. And it's all his praise, all his honor, all his glory. And I want to be a part of that. And as that happens, then Satan comes in and he tries to disrupt. He tries to, to discourage you. And, and that's what he does here with um, the people in, in Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 4, the enemy tries to discourage their efforts by mocking them, okay? He says, in chapter 4, verse 1, says, But it so happened when Sam Ballot heard that they were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and indignant, and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke of their brethren and their army, to his brethren in the army of Samaria, and he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive stones that are from the heaps of rubbish that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, 
Whatever they build, even if a fox goes on it, it will break down that stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach on their own heads, and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. They were mocking them. You know, people who see in your life, let's say you've completely messed up, and you haven't lived it in front of these people, and all of a sudden you decide to commit. First thing they do is, yeah, right, bro. We'll see you in a month. You'll be the same way you used to be, you know. Or, man, I don't believe anything you're going to say. You know, I've seen the way you live. And they tell you these things. Don't let that discourage you. You can't focus on what people are going to think about you. You have to focus on what God thinks about you. You have to allow God to comfort you. You have to allow God to lead you. Because you want to know something? He knows the purpose and plan that he has for your life. And he even knows what you're going to do ahead of time. And as he leads you. We don't know. We think we're so bummed out. We're so down and out and all these people are just confirming it throwing it in our face you know but you know what when you see uh, Gideon he's treading wine or he's thrashing wheat in a wine press you know you don't thrash wheat in a wine press you go on top of a hill and you throw it in the air and you let the shaft blow away and the wheat comes down he's hiding in a wine press so that raiders won't come and take it and raid him and kill him or whatever. And you know what? All of a sudden, the angel of the Lord appears to him. And when he appears to him, he says, and the angel of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, that's always Christ himself in the Old Testament. He appears to him, and he's like freaked out, and he says, Hail you, mighty man of valor. And, and Gideon was like, dude, you talking to me? You know who I am? You know, I'm the least, my family's the least in, the, in this tribe, and I'm the least in my family. But God knew the great things that he would do and the plan that he had for him. And that's how God looks at us. He's not looking at you like all those people. He's not looking at you like, oh man, what a failure, how am I going to use you? The Bible says, you are a shield around me. You're my glory. You're the lifter of my head. You're down. You're bum. You're hurt. You're thinking all this stuff about your life. He says, cheer up. I got you. I'm going to take care of you. Don't listen to the discouragement around you. Keep going forward with the Lord. Discouragement is also cost-specific because there's so much to do. I mean, here in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10, it says, And Judah said, The strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And, and so you can look at your life and you can say, Man, God, there's so much. How could, I, how could I change? It's such a mess. There's so much to do. Don't get your... I mean, Nehemiah's answer for that was... Don't get your eyes on yourself. Get your eyes on the Lord. You know? Because they're looking, oh man, how's this all going to get done? And when you look at that and you're looking at this, or you're, you're looking at this mountain called Holy, and you're like, how am I going to climb this thing? And you forget that it is God who does the work in you. That is the Lord that's helping you. And when you're looking at it and you're saying, man, I can't do that, you totally left out Jesus out of the equation. Because I'm guaranteeing you, Jesus is looking at that moment and saying, pew, that's nothing for me. He says, trust me. Because when we get our eyes on him, our problems seem so much smaller compared to who he is. And when we allow him to move in our heart, to move in our life, we will see the power of God. As God is faithful to keep his word, 
God will see you through. 2 Corinthians 13, 8 says, But we all with an unveiled face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord. The Holy Spirit changes you. As you surrender to him and you listen to him, because it says those that are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Let him lead you. Let him show you the direction. It's not like you can't hear him. You hear him all the time. You just say, no, I'm going to go do this. You know? That's what ends up happening. We say, God, I'm going to follow you. But your old man comes in like a monster. You know? Tells you, no. I got you. You can't be free. You can't get loose. That's all a lie. Say, look how many times you tried to change before. Look how many times you said you were sorry before. Look how many times you repented before. You're never going to make it. I've got you. No. Jesus broke the chains. Period. What's the key? Not the doing, right? But the trusting. The trusting in God's word. Do you believe that Jesus Christ at the cross broke the power of sin in your life? Do you believe it? Or are you going to believe the liar that's telling you, I got you. You're never going to get away. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He's crushed the head of the serpent in your life. You just have to go live like that now. And the way you do that is really believe God's word. Really believe God can do that. You get to be able to stand up and to be able to uh, move forward. Start to rebuild. You leave all the lies behind. Let's go forward. Because God's going to see you through. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he, Jesus is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He's able to keep you. You able to trust him? Are you willing to follow him? Are you willing to listen to him? Because those life will completely change. You'll be able to rebuild. You'll be able to start over. And he'll be getting to show you day by day why you're here. The days are short, people. They are really short. And if there was ever a time to be sold out to Jesus, it's now. It's now. Because there has never been a time in my lifetime, anyway, that I have seen where people need Jesus more than ever. You know, I was sharing with this one kid, you know, at a bus stop. And uh, he said, how could I ever thank you? I said, will you give me five minutes to share the gospel with you? And he tells me, what's the gospel? He didn't even know what the gospel was. And when I just shared the love of Jesus, the guy freaked out and he accepted the Lord. And, but they don't even hear it. They don't even know. All they know is what people say on TV, that Christians are haters. When actually, this is the love of God to the world. All we got to do is go shine that love. Let Jesus love you so that you can go out and love others. Be blown away on what God does. They also tried to attack them. You know, Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 12 says, So the Jews, when the Jews who dwelt near came, they told us ten times, Whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. They're ready to attack. They're ready to get you. They're going to tear you apart. The enemy will attack you, and he will attack you with lies, you know. And he'll tell you, it's not going to happen. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. Hey, God's sovereign over all. He's a shepherd and bishop of souls. He's a king of hosts. They can't touch you, not without his permission. And the only reason he'll let them is because he knows you can do it. He knows you can make it through. 
It's like you're afraid of heights. You say, man, I got to fly to New York. And you're thinking all week, man, you get on that plane, you get on that plane, you're going to die, you're going to die. You're at the airport, you're going to die. You get on that plane, you're going to die. You're walking on, oh my gosh, you're going to die, you're going to die. Then it takes off, it's going to crash, it's going to crash, you're going to die. And then you're flying and you feel, you know, turbulence. Oh my gosh, it's going to go down, you're going to die. And then, you know, you're going in for a landing, it's rough, and it's like, oh, you're going to die now, you're going to die now. You land, and you get off the plane, it says, you're going to die when you get back. You're going to die on the way back. Why? Because he's a liar. He's trying to control you with fear from the lies. Hey, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And he pierces the darkness, wipes out all the lies. And you can cling to him and know he's got you, man. He's going to take care of you. He'll take care of those things. Okay? They, stopped, they tried to stop the building by distractions. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 says, and, and it is reported, and they're, they're, they're saying, hey, come and meet with us. Come and meet with us. Break them away from the work, you know, that was being helped. It says, come on over here. And he says, you know what? It's been reported among the nations, and Gershom says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, that's why you're rebuilding the wall, that you may be made their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim certain that people in Jerusalem saying there is a king in Judah. Now these matters are going to be reported to the king. So come therefore, let's consult together. And then I sent them saying, no such things are as you say are being done. You invent them in your own heart. He wasn't going to be distracted. He wasn't going to let that happen. You know, they wanted to take him away so they could kill him or keep him and then he won't be able to return and the people would fear and they'd stop the work. But he knew what was going on. He says, I'm not going to waste my time with you guys. I'm not going to be distracted. But that's what happens when God starts doing a new work. All of a sudden, here comes something that the devil brings in to distract you. To pull you back away. To pull you back away from the Lord. You know? Somebody's done drugs and they say, I'm not going to do drugs no more. I'm not going to smoke weed no more, the whole thing. And he's clean. And he goes clean for a couple months. All of a sudden, somebody shows up. Hey, man, look at I got this dime back here. You can have it, man. Right in your lap to distract you. You know? Or you break up with this boyfriend or girlfriend that have been really bad for you. And you finally wanted to just get right with God. And all of a sudden, they come back and they say, oh, come on, man. Let's... Let's start over, you know. And you know they were bad for you in the first place. But you're like, oh, well, maybe, you know. Because that's the way we are, you know. That's the way we are. Don't be distracted. Remember, keep your eyes on Jesus. And he'll see you through. Because you know what? The devil wants you to live on substitutes. You have to realize that. He's a great counterfeiter. And he will tell you about peace and all these things. You know, I was just listening to a testimony of somebody that came out of the occult and everything. And they said, you know what? They're saying, they're telling you you're going to get this great power. You're going to do all these things. And you go deeper and deeper to get this power. But the deeper and deeper you go, the less control you have. The more drugs you're doing, the more things are out of control in your life. The only real stability that she ever got was when she turned to the Lord and the reality of what is truth and lies came to be. She realized and said, I'm not going to believe those lies anymore. I'm not going to fall for that anymore. And she found out what God really does. And now Nehemiah leads the people to fight. He leads them to fight. And Nehemiah tells him to keep their eyes on the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 14 says, Then I looked and arose and said to the nobles, leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. Remember who God is. Remember who God is. You see this big bully going to take you on the whole thing. He's so much bigger than you, whatever. And then here is the God of the universe that so powerful. He said, light be, bam, created light. 
The scripture says that he holds the oceans in the palm of his hand. It says he spread out the heavens like a curtain. Go look outside. I got this app on my phone where I can look and I can see all the different stars and their names, right? And I found Mars. And you realize Mars, how far Mars is? It takes like six months to get there going at like 25,000 miles an hour. Do you realize how vast the universe is? And this is the one who says, I hold you and nobody's able to take you out of my hand. This is the one that's on your side. But he's telling you, fight. Fight, persevere, believe that this is the way it is, that these are the truth and stick to them. Don't give in no more. Don't change. Let's rebuild. Let's show you why I made you. You know, so many people, you know, um, they're trying to find, you know, God's perfect will in that uh, woman or man in their life, you know, and the whole thing. And they say, Lord, where is she, you know? Is that her, Lord? Is that her? Oh, that's got to be her, Lord, you know? And they're over there, you know, trying to figure out, you know, who's God leading me to? You know, in the whole bit. Well, you want to know something? Follow God. If you're in the will of God, I guarantee you that person that is God's perfect will for you is in the will of God. And if you're walking in the will of God, you're going to find her. She's going to be right there, right in front of your face. You're not going to have to go looking for her. If you're in the will of God, if you're straying and you're not in the will of God, she just turned an 11 day journey into 40 years in the wilderness, man. Get back on the right path. Start rebuilding. Let revival come here. Let revival come to your heart. Because it's not about being religious. It's not about going through the motions. It's not about hiding what people don't know. It's about being real with God, being true with God, having true repentance, and asking the Holy Spirit to come fill me and live through me. Because God, it's not a building. It's you. The light will shine from you as you fellowship with your maker. His light will shine through you for others to see. And Nehemiah sends soldiers to help, and he even arms the people to fight, you know? And, and, and you know, the, when he arms the people to fight, it, 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 he says, okay, here's swords, guys. Now, I want you to have a working tool in one hand and a sword in the other. So in case they come, we're ready. And if someone, and if someone uh, is there attacking on one spot, you know, do the horn. We'll all come join you. And we'll all fight. And this strategy kept them at bay. But that, that, those, that's the Holy Spirit telling you here, I'm arming you with the armor of God. Stand therefore and do everything it takes to stand. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. I've armed you. And these people had a sword in one hand and a tool in the other. In other words, do the work of God and fight the good fight. That's what we're all called to do. Start building. But as you build, battle at the same time. Don't just build battle because the enemy's not going to let you do it nonchalantly. But you're going to find when you battle and you follow the will of God and you submit to the Holy Spirit, he gets scared. The scripture says submit to God and resist the devil. And when you learn to do that, he will flee from you. He'll go, oh, snap. This guy's figured it out. He's not listening to my lies anymore. Okay, let's put him on public enemy one, number one list. Because now you know the truth. You've lived it. You've discovered it. You've seen God do a work in your heart and your life. And you want that to happen in your life. You want God to do that. And the wall finally gets built. And it's in record time. It's like in 42 days they got this thing up. 
and it's completed. And, and listen, to, <coughs> listen to what happens, okay? In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 16, and now it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall and everyone to his work. Nehemiah 6, 16 says, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations surround, around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. They're like, Blown away. And now, all these threats and everything they were doing, now they're scared. Now they're scared. Because their lies didn't work. They were, they're disheartened. That word disheartened means grieved to the point of the confusion and fear of God, that God was with them. Hey, people know God's with you? Because it's not how many scriptures you can quote. It's not the facade you put on. It's the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of God shining out of your life. Can people be around you and say, man, there's something different about them? And it's because you love the Lord and you're saying, Holy Spirit, lead me. And they see that. They see that you're led by the Lord and that there's nothing else that anybody can do to stop you. They can't quench your spirit. They can't separate you from the love of God. You know, God loves you so much. But you got to remember, the only reason that we can love is because we can choose. If we didn't have choice, there would be no such thing as love. Love is a free choice. It comes from choice. And because choice exists, you can choose to love. And God loves you, but he'll never force himself on you. But he'll let you, like, flounder and go, you know, go find yourself. You know, you know my, my son uh, walked away from the Lord. You know what I told him? Hey, you know what you got to do? You got to go find out that God is for real for yourself. Because you've seen it in my life. You've got to find out that Jesus is the answer on your own. He's out there searching and searching all these different things, you know. And, and, but the hound of heaven is in his heart. And he can't escape it. And one day, he will find Jesus for real in his own life. When he has to say, God help me. God save me. But know the Lord fresh. You know, don't stray and think, you know, everything's okay. It's just grace. Get right with God. Start over. Let him heal you and make you clean and let him do a new work in your heart. You know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, but... Start by keeping your eyes on Jesus and not on yourself. That's the very beginning. Say, I'm done, Lord. Here, it's all yours. And just, okay, my eyes are on you, Lord. You lead me. You guide me. I'm trusting you. He is able. Believe his word. That's the whole key to this whole thing, is believing God's word. Because that's the main thing that the devil tries to distract you. It always has been. God says the day we eat of the tree, we'll surely die. Are you really will you die? Are you sure? You know? He just just doesn't want you to know. It's the knowledge of good and evil. It'll make you like God. Isn't it pretty? You know? It's always been to compromise God's word. Do you know why? Because God's word is the power of God. It is the sword of the Spirit. It is that thing that will bring every thought back into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. If you just let it. Don't go, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, this ain't Fred Flintstone, you know, yeah, but, that would do, right? It's just time to start. 
We have never had a time where people in this world need Jesus more than ever. And time is so short, you know. I mean, now, you know, you look at the book of Revelation, you look at Matthew chapter 24, and it says where, you know, wars and rumors of wars, plagues. Man, that's real now. We got stuff going good now. Praise the Lord. And praise the Lord, maybe it'll be over. But right now in the UK, they had to shut down again because of the Delta variant that was in India. What if this thing goes again? Are you ready? Is your heart ready? We don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. And he holds me. And he holds you. So no matter what the world may bring, no matter what crisis will come, let's rebuild. Let's start over. Let's fall in love with Jesus afresh. And let him hold us in his hand. Let him speak to our hearts. Let him fill us with his Holy Spirit. Let him change us day by day. And let us shine to a world that needs him so much. All these people that are out there, man, in the pandemic, don't know the Lord, man, they need the Lord. I don't know how people do it without Jesus. Jesus is my comforter. He's my friend. Keeps me from being lonely. He's the purpose in my life. He shows me that he loves me every day by the grace and mercy that he has upon me to allow me to get up and follow him again. We all have that opportunity now. Let's rebuild life. Let's allow God to move fresh and new in our hearts so that we can fall in love with our creator all over again.